Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I appreciate that. It's uh, you know, a nasty June evening. It feels more like March out there, but, um, but I do appreciate everybody coming out. I know this is a really hot topic because it's uh, so frequent, uh, it, it's so prevalent, I should say, in our society, and you're gonna see evidence of that in, in the uh, talk tonight. Uh, just briefly about myself, I'm going into my 17th year of practice, private practice, part of Hopedale Cardiology. Those of you who may have heard of Dr. Shine, he kind of came down to the Milford area, started uh, cardiology pretty much by himself. Uh, I trained with him, and then two years after he was out by himself, I joined him, and shortly thereafter, it became Hopedale Cardiology. It was just the two of us for about five and a half years, and then we brought on other physicians. So we now have six physicians in the group, six cardiologists, two nurse practitioners, and a physician assistant. So it's, it's uh, grown to be a big group, and, and uh, uh, we try and provide a great service to the community, and, and we really enjoy doing these types of talks and trying to educate our patients. Um, briefly, my background, uh, I went to Syracuse University undergrad. I got a master's in physiology at Georgetown University. I then went on and got my uh, uh, MD at Georgetown University, and then went to UMass Medical Center, where I did all my residency training and my cardiology training. Um, so that's just you know, a little bit of my background in, in terms of uh, my education and how I kind of got to here. Uh, just, I do have to disclose a couple things. Uh, I'm a Jersey boy, so I'm from New Jersey. So unfortunately for a lot of you, I'm a Yankee fan and Giants fan. So I do apologize to those. I know, I know, but... <coughs> Yeah, I, I do like the Jets, but I'm more of a Giants fan. My daughter got married last week. Her father and I came in with Yankee hats on to the There we go. There we go. But don't hold that against me. Don't hold that against me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So why don't we get started? Oh, by the way, just real quickly, why don't we hold, if it's okay with everybody, we'll, only because it's such a big group, we'll hold questions till the end of the talk. Normally, I actually like questions while I'm going along, but I, I think with so many people um, and, and so many slides that I have to go through, it might be easier for us to just talk at the end, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, a lot of questions may be answered actually through the talk, uh, so, so it might make sense to just wait until the end. I thought what I would do is just start off, and I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence here, but just a very sort of basic anatomy of, of the heart because I think that'll help in terms of figuring out what this atrial fibrillation is all about. And um, so real basic, our heart is made up of four chambers and the two top chambers are called the atria and the two bottom chambers are called the ventricles. The electrical impulse of our heart begins in the top right chamber of the heart and that area is called the sinus node. From there, the electrical impulse actually spreads across the top chambers of the heart and what it does is it tries to tell those top chambers to squeeze blood in a coordinated fashion down to the two bottom chambers, to the ventricles. In order to get the electrical impulse to get down to the bottom chambers though, I, I'm sorry, in order, so, so it'll first squeeze blood, tell the, the electrical impulse spreads across the top chambers, tells them to squeeze blood to the bottom chambers, but then we need the bottom chambers, the ventricles, to sort of do something as well. So we need the electrical impulse to get down there. And the way it gets down there, it goes through an area between the atria and the ventricles, which is called the AV node, standing for atrial ventricular node. It's just a little area between the top and bottom chambers. So the electrical impulse comes through there and actually hesitates for a split second. I always think of it like the old toll booths where you threw your change in and you had the gate and you had to wait for the gate to go up. So it kind of does that. It pays its toll, waits for the gate to go up, and then it continues down to the bottom chambers. And then the electrical impulse will travel to the ventricles and it tells those chambers, those two bottom chambers, to squeeze blood in a coordinated fashion. The bottom right chamber squeezes blood out to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. The bottom left chamber squeezes blood out to the body through the main artery called the aorta. So this is just sort of a representation of what, what's happening. So one represents the sinus node, which it's really there where four is lo located. It's kind of off a little bit. But basically that electrical impulse starts right there. It spreads across the top chambers of the heart. So that's the left atrium right there. That's the right atrium. And this is anatomic left and right. Okay, so it's, it's opposite to you. So if I come over here, it's my right, my left. If I turn this way, 
it's still my right over here if I come back this way. Okay, that's always confusing to people. So we, we talk in terms of anatomic position. But anyway, the, the electrical impulse starts right there in the sinus node, spreads across, and then kind of works its way eventually down to the area down here called the sinoatrial node, spreads down to the ventricles, and, and we try and get a nice coordinated uh, contraction of the top chambers, bottom chambers, everything working together, nice and synchronized. This is just another slide, kind of cleaning it up just a little bit, showing the sinus node up here where the electrical impulse begins, sort of spreads across the top chambers down to the um, AV node, and from there down to the ventricles left and right. Okay. <clears throat> well, what happens with atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is sort of this chaotic electrical activity that's occurring in the top chambers of the heart. And some people actually describe this almost like a tor little tornadoes of electrical activity. And that's what these little things represent here, little tornadoes of electrical activity. So instead of it originating in that sin uh, SA node, sinoatrial node, which is number one right here, or where it's supposed to be, it, the electrical impulse in atrial fibrillation is many electrical impulses throughout the atria. It probably originates, though, actually over here in what's called the pulmonary veins. But that's, we don't necessarily need to get into that. We'll hear a little bit more about that later. More importantly, though, it's, it's a chaotic type of multiple electrical activities from the top chambers of the heart that begin to bombard that AV node, which is right down here. And with that, we end up getting frequent electrical impulses coming down to the bottom chambers of the heart, the ventricles, but it's irregular. It's not, so what happens in normal heart rhythm, when we start off with the electrical impulse in the sinus node, it delivers an impulse, it travels down, it goes down to the bottom chambers, everything's nice and rhythmic, 60 beats a minute, 70 beats a minute, 85 beats a minute. Well, what happens here is there's no, it's many, many electrical impulses, so it just frequently bombards that AV node. A whole bunch of it seems that gate, that toll booth gate, almost stays open. And just because it's paying the toll so quickly, the gate stays open, the electrical impulses go down, so now the bottom chamber, chambers beat rapidly and irregularly or erratically. And that's when people often start getting their symptoms. Rapid heartbeat, irregular heartbeat, uh, sometimes feeling lightheaded or faint, um, just not feeling yourself sometimes. And this is just to represent the sort of tornado that we think about, little tornadoes of electrical activity in the top chambers of the heart. What this actually is, is a mapping of the left atrium, just that top left chamber of the heart, and these are pulmonary veins coming off, and that's supposed to represent the electrical activity, multiple areas of electrical activity in that top chamber of the heart top left chamber, the left atrium. We're going to kind of come back to some of that in a little bit, that, but again, just, that was just a brief idea of what, what happens both in terms of the anatomy of the heart, the makeup, and the electrical activity of the heart. So atrial fibrillation is a very, very common problem. It affects up to 2.7 million Americans. I mean, it's just a ridiculous number of people. Uh, it's the most common rhythm disorder in, in, you, in adults over the age of 65 in the United States. Um, it's associated with about a five-time increased risk of stroke. That, that's an important fact, about a five-time increased risk of stroke. 15 to 20 percent of all strokes are attributable to atrial fibrillation. So it's pretty significant. Generally, these, are, these can be major strokes causing significant disability or even death. And, and this, this will kind of get into a lot more in just a little bit. Patients with atrial fibrillation add about $26 billion to the nation's health care costs in just one year. It's just, it's, it's hard to even think about those numbers. So atrial fibrillation related hospitalizations are predicted to climb to over 3.3 million by the year to, uh, 2025. And it's going to be a staggering burden on our public health care system and not to mention on patients themselves, obviously. It's, uh, for, for a lot of patients, it, it's quite, they're quite symptomatic with it. Not all, though. <coughs> Excuse me. So this slide is just showing you the, uh, some of my slides, by the way, are from the European Society of Cardiology. So you're going to see one slide where you're going to say, is that English or did he misspell all that? <laughs> but it's from the European Society of Cardiology. 
Um, and what this slide is just showing us is the uh, patients with atrial fibrillation in the millions going from 1990 and, and then their prediction out to, I can't even read that, to, uh, 2050. 2050. And, and we can see, depending on which model is used, but regardless, it doesn't really matter, it, it's, there's a significant increase over the years. And, and it's actually pretty interesting. We're not really sure why that is. But we are definitely seeing more and more atrial fibrillation. And I think that's evidenced by the, how, how full this room is tonight, that this is really a significant problem. The other thing that we know about atrial fibrillation is that with each decade of life, it becomes more and more prevalent. So as people get into their 60s, their 70s, their 80s, their 90s, and I have patients that are 100 and above, uh, it, it becomes more and more common. So just getting older, it becomes, it, your risk of AFib goes up. Now interestingly, when I started my practice 17 years ago, or started in practice 17 years ago, if I saw atrial fibrillation in somebody down to the age of 40, I'd kind of go, whew, that's interesting. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't reportable, but it was really interesting. I mean, you just didn't see it that often. I now see atrial fibrillation in people down into their 20s. I had a 20-year-old with atrial fibrillation. So it is really becoming an epidemic in, in, our, um, in the United States, but also worldwide. So as I just mentioned, atrial fibrillation is strongly age-dependent. It affects 4% of the population over the age of 60. 8% of the population over the age of 80, so it just becomes more and more common with each decade of life. About 25% of people over the age of 40 will develop AFib during their lifetime. 25% over the age of 40 will develop AFib over the lifetime. So it's just a huge number of people that, that are having this issue. <clears throat> and this is just a graphic representation of that where um, we can see that the uh, women are in the darker color and the men in the, I guess, lighter color. Um, I'm a little colorblind. But, um, and you can see the numbers are right around 25% at all age groups. And interestingly, which we'll talk about in a second, men have a slightly higher risk than women do. So as I just mentioned, incidence of atrial AF obviously standing for atrial fibrillation, is significantly higher in men than it is in women for all age groups. There's a higher incidence in Caucasians compared with African American uh, people. 10 to 15 percent of the cases occur without any other medical conditions. So you just get it. But about 85 to 90 percent are associated with other medical conditions like diabetes or other cardiovascular disease such as high blood pressure, which is hypertension, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, or heart valve problems. So the more medical problems one has, the more likely it is, unfortunately, to get atrial fibrillation. So there's about a 1.5 to 1.9 fold increase in risk of dying from atrial fibrillation, and this is mainly due to what's called thromboembolic events. So what is a thromboembolic event? Thromboembolic event is where we develop a blood clot, that's a thrombus. Embolus just means it leaves where it, forms, where it formed and goes somewhere else. So thromboembolic or thromboembolism, clot forms, part of the clot or all the clot breaks off and travels somewhere else. So that's a thromboembolic event. The one that we're most concerned about in atrial fibrillation is, is going, the clot breaking off and going to the brain and causing a stroke. But it can go elsewhere. It can cause other problems. I don't like that slide. <laughs> so what are some causes of atrial fibrillation? Well, common causes are hypertension, high blood, which is high blood pressure, heart valve problems such as narrowed heart valves or leaky heart valves, more appropriately called regurgitant heart valves, COPD, which we used to call emphysema, and other lung issues. So any lung problems at all can certainly put one at risk for atrial fibrillation. Thyroid abnormalities, more commonly overactive thyroid, hyperthyroidism, but it can occasionally occur with an underactive thyroid, hypothyroidism. Sleep apnea, huge, huge association between sleep apnea and atrial fibrillation. As an aside, many other cardiovascular uh, issues associated with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is very, very important to diagnose 
and treat because the consequences of that from a cardiovascular perspective are significant, atrial fibrillation being one of them. And by the way, those people who have sleep apnea that's either undiagnosed or untreated um, because for whatever reason, one chooses not to, unable to wear the mask, whatever it may be, uh, very difficult to control their AFib, much more difficult. AFib can be caused by alcohol and something that we call holiday heart. So not uncommonly after New Year's Eve, uh, the next day, uh, 4th of July, people kind of binging a little bit. They don't normally have alcohol or even those who do uh, will come in in atrial fibrillation. So not uncommonly after holidays, we will see people uh, who had a little bit more to drink and they come in with their AFib. There's something called sick sinus syndrome, which is just a fancy way of saying there's a problem with the electrical system in the heart. And that's a common thing that occurs as people get older or the electrical system doesn't work as well as it used to and it sets us up for many different issues such as atrial fibrillation um, or the heart, uh, heart rate going too fast at one time or too slowly at another time. It's actually a very common cause, um, sick sinus syndrome, for pacemakers. So those of you who are out here who might have pacemakers, many of you have it because of sick sinus syndrome. Any acute illness or any surgery uh, can be a cause of atri a precipitant for atrial fibrillation. So uh, most commonly in terms of surgery, it's cardiac surgery, so bypass, heart valves, things like that, because the, when you get in there and you're irritating the heart, it can be a precipitant to atrial fibrillation, but we see it with all kinds of surgery. Um, I've even seen it with, it's not that it's surgery, but colonoscopies. Um, so, so really almost any procedure or surgery can put uh, people into atrial fibrillation. Possibly medicines, uh, for example, stimulants like, like pseudoephedrine that people use for colds and runny noses, uh, Sudafed is an example of that. Um, possibly caffeine, although really I tell my patients who have atrial fibrillation, you, you kind of have to figure that one out on your own. I mean, there's a lot of people with atrial fibrillation, they have caffeine, doesn't bother them at all. Other people are really sensitive to it. So that's one that you just have to figure out on your own. There's something called vaguely, and I'll explain this in a second, vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation, which is more common in young men, and it's um, where we get vagal stimulation. Again, I'll explain that in a second. For example, when people have a, a cold liquid. So we have a nerve in our body called the vagus nerve, does a whole bunch of things. What, but when it comes to the cardiovascular system, most commonly when it gets stimulated, it more commonly actually slows the heart rate down or lowers the blood pressure. But for some reason, there's a mechanism that when this nerve gets stimulated, it can actually put people into atrial fibrillation. I have a young um, uh, man in my practice, he's about 40 years old, and uh, every time he drinks a cold liquid too rapidly, he goes into atrial fibrillation. And sometimes he forgets, and he drinks it, and it's rapid, and then he literally is, he's like, uh-oh, and he just waits for the AFib to start, and it's like clockwork, it'll start. So he has to warm, let his liquids come down to room temperature and drink them slowly so he doesn't go into AFib. So, so that's because when we swallow, we can actually stimulate the vagus nerve. A small percentage of people actually have a gene that will code for atrial fibrillation. We know that AFib can run in families. We've known that for years and years. Um, I'm horrible with timelines, but probably sometime in the last 10 years or so, uh, somebody coded a gene that puts people at risk for atrial fibrillation. That, that's clearly the minority of people though. And then there's people who have really no obvious cause for atrial fibrillation and they're called lone AFib, L-O-N-E, lone atrial fibrillation. So no real reason for them to have it, they just have it. Um, and, and that's a small percentage, but it's a fair number of people nonetheless. So what's the big deal about atrial fibrillation? Why are we all here? Why do we care? What, what's going on with this? Well, I always tell people there's two, even though there's a whole bunch of issues, there's two kind of major issues with atrial fibrillation. One is symptoms, and in particular, symptoms are palpitations. So you feel your heart jumping around in your chest, beating erratically. I had one patient who took me forever to figure out what he was talking about, but he used to say to me, I feel like there's fish on deck. I'm like, what are you talking about, fish on deck? For, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, it took years for me to figure out what he meant. So like the fish flopping around, when you catch them, they're flopping around on deck, that's what his heart felt like. It would be like fish on deck. 
And um, he lives on Block Island, and he comes up to see me. So he's out on the ocean fishing, all that. So that's why he thought of that. But, but it is kind of a good description, really. It's your heart beating erratically, just sort of not doing what it's supposed to do. Normally, we don't feel our heartbeat at all. So as soon as we feel our heartbeat, it becomes kind of unsettling. Um, there are other symptoms that can occur with atrial fibrillation, for example, fatigue and just overall decreased quality of life that can happen with, with atrial fibrillation. Sometimes they're very subtle signs that can be attributed to, or symptoms that can be attributed to anything, like, as I mentioned, fatigue, just not feeling well, lethargy, um, uh, just not having the energy that you used to have. You know, the problem with those symptoms are, again, they can be attributed to a thousand and one things, uh, not sleeping well, not eating well, having a cold, whatever it may be. So it can sometimes be difficult to figure out what that's from in the beginning. By the way, one of the interesting things about symptoms are some people are exceedingly symptomatic. I have one patient who's a surgeon who has atrial fibrillation. He stopped practicing because he was so symptomatic, he was nervous that he'd get his symptoms, his AFib, during an operation, and he couldn't deal with that. It just made him feel horrible. He literally stopped because he's not a physician anymore um, because his symptoms were so significant. I have other patients who are in atrial fibrillation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have no idea they're in it. They just go about their lives as though nothing's going on. Those people who are symptomatic find that really hard to believe. Those people who are without symptoms, asymptomatic, find it hard to believe that somebody would stop being a surgeon <laughs> because of their AFib. So it just runs the gamut from no symptoms at all all the way up to very significant symptoms. Um, other, other issues that, that, sort of, that we can uh, have with atrial fibrillation is congestive heart failure, something called a tachycardic induced cardiomyopathy, where if the heart rate is too fast for too long, it can actually make the heart not squeeze very well. And, and that's called a cardiomyopathy. The other big issue, though, that we, ro we worry about is risk of stroke or other thromboembolic event. Again, thromboembolic meaning a clot forming somewhere, meaning in, our, in this case we're talking about the in the heart, and then part of it breaking off and going elsewhere in the body. So how does a stroke happen with atrial fibrillation? Well, a clot will form in that top left chamber of the heart. And in fact, one of the things that we didn't see on those diagrams of the anatomy of the heart is on that top left chamber called the left atrium, there's actually something called the left atrial appendage. And it looks like a uh, finger sticking off that top left chamber or a windsock, you know, at an airport. We even have one here for our helicopter out in the parking lot. So it looks kind of like a windsock or a finger. And that's actually really where the highest risk of a clot forming is in that left atrial appendage. And that can break off and go from there down to the left ventricle, that bottom left chamber of the heart. From there, it's almost a straight shot, unfortunately, right up to the brain um, and cause a stroke. And, and, and um, you know, strokes obviously can be fairly devastating, causing things like blindness, difficulty walking, paralysis, permanent disability, and, and obviously the ultimate issue would be dying from a stroke. Um, so, so there's, it's something that we really want to try and prevent if possible. So this is my slide where this is not a typographical error uh, or a spelling error. This is from the European Society of Cardiology. But I like the slide, so I, I stole it. And, um, and, and basically what it's just showing is down here, it's obviously more cartoonish than anything else, but it's showing the left, the left atrium uh, developing a clot which breaks off and goes out, and this represents the aorta, and this is one of the, the arteries heading up to the brain, and, and it literally is almost a straight shot to the brain from there. And that, that's, that actually is fairly representative of how it, it literally just straight up there. Um, so it's, it's something we want to <laughs> prevent for people. Well, how do, how do we prevent a stroke uh, from atrial fibrillation? Well, various medicines are out there for us to try and decrease the likelihood of a blood clot forming. And those include things like antiplatelet agents. Some common one, obviously, is aspirin. People are very familiar with aspirin. Another pretty common one is Plavix, which has now gone generic, by the way, and it's called, the generic name is clopidogrel. Um, so for those of you on Plavix, you're gonna save a lot of money because <laughs> it's uh, quite expensive. Um, we also have other things such as oral anticoagulants. The most common one that people know about is Coumadin. The generic of that is warfarin. So 
What I wanted to put down though, because I get this all the time, people always tell me after I start them on cumin and they say, oh, I'm cold since you started me on cumin. I'm cold now. And I said, well, why are you cold? And they said, well, you put me on that blood thinner. Coumadin does not make you cold. It does not thin your blood. Nope. There's re essentially no, no, nothing that thins your blood. Aspirin doesn't thin your blood. Coumadin doesn't thin your blood. Well, what does it do? It decreases the blood's ability to form a blood clot. It does not thin your blood. You do not get cold from Coumadin. If you do, I hate to tell you why you're getting cold, but it's up here. It's called a placebo effect. And our, our brains are really powerful things. They can make us, you know, if I gave everybody a pill in here for atrial fibrillation and it was a sugar pill and I said there's a chance of a cough from this pill, a fair percentage of you will have a cough. And again, it's just the way, it's human nature. It's the way our brains work. Doesn't mean people are crazy. It's just the way, way it works. Now, Coumadin is rat poison. So a lot of people say to me, oh, I don't want to take that because it's rat poison. Well, chocolate and grapes are poisonous to dogs. But we don't call it dog poison. We call it chocolate and grapes. So just because something's poisonous to one species doesn't mean it is to another. So for us, it's not poison. For us, it's actually helpful. So using it, the excuse that I don't want to take it because it's rat poison, you know, I, most people are probably eating chocolate and grapes, so they're eating dog poison, and it doesn't make you cold. Um, some newer medicines that are out there, a lot of people may have heard about, it's on television all the time, that's a whole other thing that drives me insane, these television <laughs> commercials for medicine, is Pradaxa. The, the generic is Dabagatran, uh, is the generic name of that. And then there's some newer oral, uh, other oral anticoagulants out there, which I cannot pronounce this, but I think it's Zerelto, but I can't pronounce it. But the easier for me is actually Rivaroxaban, that's the generic of that. That was just FDA approved. And then there's another one that's going to be coming out soon called Apixaban. Apixaban. So we're going to talk a little bit about some, some of these. First, though, we're going to talk about Coumadin because, or Warfarin, the generic of Coumadin, because most people are really familiar with this. And, and somewhat understandably, people are kind of opposed to going on it. It's a little bit of a pain in the tush to be on, on Warfarin, in particular when we initiate it. It, it can be a little bit of a, of a pain. And, and one of the reasons it's a pain is because it requires blood tests. And those of you who are on it or have been on it know in the beginning it requires frequent blood tests. And most people call the blood test a Coumadin test, but it's really not. It's something called an INR, or International Normalized Ratio. International Normalized Ratio. And that is a typo up there. Um, so, the, so what we do with this blood test is when, when you go for your blood work, uh, and we're getting this blood test called an INR, International Normalized Ratio, we want the value of that blood test, the result, to be somewhere between two to three. Two to three, okay? So we draw your blood, it gets stuck in a machine, the machine prints something out and goes, ah, the INR is 2.2. Perfect, that's right between two and three, right where we want you, or 2.5, or 3.0, or 2.1. Those are all good, all good. 1.9, not as good. 3.4, not good. We want it between two and three, and we're going to see why that is in just a second. So warfarin, Coumadin, is different from any other medication, or many medications, I should say, in that if someone is only taking one milligram a day of Coumadin or warfarin, but their INR is between two to three, this has the same exact effect as someone taking, for example, 15 milligrams a day of Coumadin, and their INR is between two to three. So how can that be? How can one person take one milligram and have their INR be, be between two to three, and somebody else need 15 milligrams a day and have their INR be between two and three? Well, it's how that, those people metabolize the Coumadin. We metabolize it through our liver. Some people metabolize it quickly, so their body just eats it up real quickly, so they need higher doses of Coumadin to maintain an INR between two to three. Some people, their liver just doesn't metabolize it very quickly, so it stays in their system a lot longer, so they may only need one milligram of Coumadin to achieve an INR of two to three. It doesn't matter. So the reason I say that is people get all worried when they hear, oh, I'm going to put you on 300 milligrams of X medication, and they'll say, well, isn't that a lot? 
So same thing occurs with this. I'll get lots of patients who will say to me, well, you know, why is my friend only taking 2.5 milligrams a day of Coumadin and I'm taking 12.5 milligrams a day of Coumadin? Well, you're having the same exact effect because the INR, hopefully, is between two to three. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, some problems with Coumadin is that anything that one consumes has the potential to affect your INR. Medicines, food, doesn't matter what it is, it has the potential to make the INR either higher than three or lower than two, depending on what it is you consumed. Vitamin K is one of the things that can affect your INR. Vitamin K will reverse the effects of warfarin. It'll actually drive the INR down. So if somebody is on, we'll just make it up, five milligrams a day of Coumadin, and their INR is between two to three, not having any problems, and then they have a big spinach salad, and then next day or two days later, they go and have their blood done, their INR done, all of a sudden their INR is gonna be well below two if they had enough vitamin, you know, enough spinach because of the vitamin K. So that's where it was, and still is said, that people shouldn't have, should not have, leafy green vegetables when they're on Coumadin. Well, that's old thinking. You can actually have, you may, eat leafy green vegetables even though it has vitamin K. In fact, we want you to. Why wouldn't we want you to have something healthy like leafy green vegetables? Now, what may occur with that is, if you have a salad every day, just as an example, and before you had a salad every day, you were taking Coumadin and your INR was between two to three and you were only taking five milligrams a day of Coumadin to achieve that goal of two to three. Well now, if you start having a salad every day, it's gonna have vitamin K, so we have to overcome the effects of that vitam vitamin K. So you might need seven and a half milligrams of Coumadin a day, or 10 milligrams of Coumadin a day. But it doesn't matter, it's not like we're giving you too much medicine because we're gonna follow your INR, and as long as it's between two to three, it's the same exact effect. So, the main thing about Coumadin is, try and be as consistent as you possibly can be with your diet. So I always use myself as an example. I have at least one large salad every single day. At least one, usually two. If I went on Coumadin, I'd continue to do that. I just might need higher doses of Coumadin to overcome the vitamin K in my diet. So we actually encourage you to have your leafy green vegetables, but just be consistent with it. Okay, some newer medicines that are out there. Um, the one that most people have heard about now, because it's been out since, in terrible timelines, but I think it's October 2010. It was FDA approved, October 2010. And that's called Pradaxa. And this is something that's called a direct thrombin inhibitor. And what does that mean? Well, I'll kind of show you in a little bit what that means, but nonetheless, that's what it is. So the way Pradaxa came about was mainly through this trial called the Re RELY trial, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it really doesn't matter. And they looked at 18,000 patients in this study, and they found that Pradaxa was actually superior, better than Coumadin, in decreasing the risk of stroke. So it was actually pretty good. The rate of major bleeding was actually lower with Pradaxa than it was with Coumadin, including hemorrhagic stroke, meaning bleeding in your brain. Now the overall rate of bleeding was actually slightly higher with Pradaxa than it was with Coumadin, but major bleeding was actually lower. It's kind of interesting. Another issue that they found though in the RELY trial and subsequent to that is that the risk of heart attacks was slightly increased in people taking Pradaxa, but it was only 0.2% increased risk. Now obviously if, if someone is the one who gets, has a heart attack because of Pradaxa, that risk then is 100% for them. But overall, when we look at the statistics, it, it's quite low. Um, another uh, issue about Pradaxa, a nice issue, is that foods and medicines, do, they don't seem to affect it. So we don't run into that problem like we do with the Coumadin, where your INR is affected. Um, the foods and medicines don't seem to, to affect that. Now, another nice thing about Pradaxa is that blood tests aren't required. It's basically, for the most part, it's 150 milligrams twice a day. There's another dose that's FDA approved, 110 milligrams twice a day. But there's a long story that goes with that. That wasn't really studied very well. 
and how we got to the FDA approving it is a long, long story. I personally don't use that dose. I use the, uh, I'm sorry, I think it's a 75 twice a day, 75 twice a day, not 110. So the other dosing is 75 milligrams twice a day. I, I don't use that. I use only the 150 twice a day. Um, so, so again, blood tests are not required, but this actually is a concern for some people. Some people actually worry about that because they say, well, how do you know it's working? It's a good point. Uh, I think we have to have a little faith that the studies that were done show that it actually works and without any blood tests. But some people are really uncomfortable, both patients and physicians, not having that blood test like we do for Coumadin to know that you're in a therapeutic range and that you're safe. And you're figuring, well, if I'm taking the medicine, I want to know I'm safe by taking it, so let me get a blood test. Um, another issue with Pradax is drug stability. The pills have to stay in a special bottle. So those of you out there who might be on it know what I'm talking about, but this is mainly because of concern of moisture causing breakdown and decreased potency. So it actually comes in sort of this high-tech bottle that it, it needs to stay in. So you can't take it out and put it in your, your pill things that a lot of people do, understandably, so that you remember to take your pills. Um, but you can't do that with this. We certainly need to use this with caution in patients who have kidney problems. And in fact, most of us, at least in my group, um, we're somewhat conservative, so if anybody has any kidney problems at all, we pretty much don't use it. It's just not worth it. The bleeding risk goes up dramatically in people with kidney problems on Pradaxa. There's also an increased risk of gastrointestinal bleeding in people over the age of 75. So we're not using it in anybody 75 years of age and above. It's just not worth it. You know, I'd rather use Coumadin. There's some reported deaths worldwide from gastrointestinal bleeding in, people that it was in, in patients that, uh, that used it that were in their 80s. Um, uh, I'm trying to think where it was. I know, I think Australia had some and Japan had some uh, deaths from it. So we, at least in our group, we, we decided uh, people 75 years of age and older, we're, we're just not using it. It's, it's just not worth it. Um, some of the newer ones that are coming out and actually one that, that has been, uh, was just FDA approved is River Roxaban. Again, that's that Zerlerto that I can't really, I don't think that's truly how you pronounce it, but I have no idea how to. Um, these are what are called factor 10A inhibitors. And, and you'll see what, again, I'll come back to what that means in just a, a few minutes. So River Roxaban um, came about, mainly got FDA pr a approved through a trial called the Rocket AF trial where they looked at 14,000 patients. So these are actually a large number of patients in these studies. A lot of cardiology does large number of patient studies like this, just sort of as an aside. Whereas if you look at studies for other medical problems, they usually have 500, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000. But uh, cardiology tends to do much higher studies, I think just because we have so many more people with these issues, we're able to. Um, so anyway, it looked at about 14,000 patients and that have atrial fibrillation, and they treated them with rivaroxaban and half the group with warfarin. And they found, it's kind of an interesting statement, so that's why I put it in quotes, rivaroxaban was not inferior to Coumadin in regard to risk of, stro cause, uh, risk of stroke, decreasing risk of stroke, or bleeding complications. Well, what does that mean, not inferior? So basically, it, it did the same thing Coumadin did. It lowered the risk of stroke just as well as Coumadin did, and it didn't increase the risk of bleeding. So well, why use it then? If you know, Coumadin is pennies, warfarin is pennies, and we've been using it forever, why would we use rivaroxaban? Well, the benefit, again, is no blood tests. A lot of people like that. Again, the blood tests can be bothersome to people, especially people who travel, for example. You know, if you're a business person or you just like traveling for leisure or whatever it may be, um, getting your blood done and getting communication on what to do with your Coumadin and et cetera can be problematic. So, so this can be pretty helpful not needing blood tests. And again, there's minimal to no interaction with medications or food. So that's also another thing. You don't have to really worry as much. You just kind of take it and do your thing and live your life. Um, a newer medicine, which I don't believe is quite FDA approved yet, is something called Apixaban. Apixaban, again, it's a factor 10A inhibitor. And this came out through the Aristotle trial, which was 18,000 patients. And again, large numbers of people. Um, and they actually found that apixaban was superior to warfarin, better than warfarin, in reducing the risk of stroke. And it actually had decreased bleeding. I mean, this one sounded really good. But again, everything that sounds good has to have some downside, right? And I don't know what that is yet, but I'm sure we'll find out. Um, so we're still waiting to hear more information about apixaban. 
But that's a promising drug that's on the horizon, as is, I think, the river roxaban, I think, is a pretty promising drug. I certainly need to get more information. I tend not to prescribe these medicines, as my group as well tends not to prescribe these right away. The river roxaban was just FDA approved months ago, two, three, four months ago. Um, so, you know, we'd like to wait and get a track record with these medicines before we start prescribing them. Um, some problems with these newer medicines, like the Pradaxa, the Rivaroxaban, and the Apixaban, um, there's no way to reverse the anticoagulation effects of them. So with warfarin, Coumadin, if somebody comes in and they need to go to surgery immediately, we can actually give them vitamin K and reverse the effects of the, the warfarin. Well, with Pradaxa, Rivaroxaban, and Apixaban, we can't do that. We don't have anything to do that. Now, there are some studies looking at some uh, ways of possibly reversing rivaroxaban and apixaban, but it's not there yet for clinical use. One of the nice things about Pradaxa, though, is it's pretty short-acting. So if you stop taking basically two doses, one day's worth, you're almost back to where you were as though you're not taking it, which is a negative as well, right? So if you miss a dose, you're not protected. So there's always, you know, medicine is just a risk-benefit ratio, right? That's all it is. There's never, almost anything we do, including doing nothing, has either some risk or no risk. I mean, it, it, there's, it's never zero risk. So we try and give our patients the most benefit with the least amount of risk, whatever it is we're doing. The most benefit with the least amount of risk, but not no risk. There's, I know that's not proper grammar, but not no risk. There's always some risk with, with whatever we do, including sometimes doing nothing. What the heck is this? <laughs> so this is getting back to where I said, I'll tell you what the uh, antithrombin inhibitor, factor 10A inhibitors, this is called the clotting cascade. And this is how blood clots form. Believe it or not, these are proteins in our blood that allow blood clots to form. And at some point, I actually knew all this, but uh, I don't remember all the details anymore. I remember it in general. But what happens is, and, and this isn't meant for you to learn from, it's just to give you a, kind of an idea of how this all works. So, Coumadin works over here in what's called the extrinsic pathway. It affects these proteins over here so that we can't come all the way down here and form a clot over here. So again, it decreases the blood's ability to form a blood clot. It doesn't thin your blood. It actually affects these proteins so that it can't keep going down through the cascade and form a clot as easily, all right? The factor 10A inhibitors, I can't really see, so I apologize, uh, are right up in here. So that's just part of the clotting cascade. It's another, it's another area, another protein in that blood clotting cascade that's affected by these newer medicines so that we can't continue down the pathway to form a blood clot. Okay. There will be a quiz on this, by the way. That's what they did to us in medical school. Um, so who needs anticoagulation? How do we figure out who should be on warfarin or Pradax or whatever it is we feel is best for that patient? But how do we figure out who actually needs to be on it? Well, in some ways it was a lot easier years ago, and in some ways it's easier now. We actually have a scoring system, several scoring systems, or a couple actually, which I'll talk about right now. One is called the CHADS-2 scoring system, and it's a mnemonic to help us figure out who probably will benefit from anticoagulation. Although we're not using this as much anymore. But I'll go over it because it's, it's, uh, we, we have basically something that's added on to this. So the mnemonic CHADS2, the C, stands for congestive heart failure. If somebody's ever had a history of congestive heart failure or decreased heart function, they get a point. If somebody has a history of high blood pressure, hypertension, even if it's controlled on medicines, you get a point. A stands for age, greater than or equal to 75, you get a point. D stands for diabetes mellitus, if you have that, you get a point. And S2 stands for stroke or TIA, which sometimes people refer to as a mini stroke, or any other thromboembolic event, you get two points. So that's why it's S2, you get two points. Well, what we do is we add that score up, however many points you have, and then we come to this. And we say, well, if you have zero points, you're pretty low risk, so you probably can be on aspirin. Anywhere from 81 to 325. 
Nobody really knows what the appropriate dose is. If you have one point, you probably could be on either aspirin or warfarin. But if you have two points or more, you probably need to be on warfarin. And it's kind of based on what's the risk of stroke versus what's your risk of complications from anticoagulation. And again, we're trying to do a risk-benefit ratio, give you the most benefit with the least amount of risk. Okay. We're not using this that much anymore. There's actually a better system, and it's called the CHADS VASC scoring system. It's a little bit more involved, but not much. So again, I stole this slide from the European uh, Society of Cardiology, and they actually left something out on here, which I'll, go, I'll add it as I, a, after I'm done going through these. Um, so we come back to the CHADS. It's similar to the CHADS. So it's up in here. The CHADS is right there. But we added things to it. And so still congestive heart failure or decreased heart function, you get a point. High blood pressure, you get a point. I'm going to come down here for a second because it makes more sense. If you're between 65 and 74, you get a point, so age. But if you're greater than or equal to 75, you now get two points. If you have diabetes, you still get a point. If you've had a stroke or a mini stroke or any thromboembolic event, clot forming one place, moving somewhere else, like a pulmonary embolism, you get two points. If you have vascular disease, carotid disease, lower extremity blockages in the legs, for example, you get a point. Yeah, I, at first when I saw sex, I wasn't quite sure what to think of that, but, <laughs> but it's female sex. If you're female, you actually get a point. And the thing that they left out was coronary artery disease. And, and it's kind of odd, but that's the, what the C is supposed to be for. So if you have a history of blocked arteries in your heart, whether you've had a heart attack or not, you get a point for that as well. Okay. So we're going to come back to that, okay, that scoring system. So that helps us figure out, by adding up those points, it kind of helps us figure out who might need anticoagulation. But we talked about just a few slides earlier on the CHAD scoring system, some people might be able to use aspirin if their score was either a zero or a one on the chat, just the plain old CHADS2 scoring system. Well, some things have come out to tell us that might not actually be the case. For example, a study from Birmingham, the Birmingham atrial fib trial um, found that there was no difference in major bleeding between warfarin when your INR was between two and three and compared to people, uh, I'm sorry, compared with people taking aspirin, there was really no major difference in bleeding. Well, that's an important fact because people are under the impression that you have more bleeding with Coumadin than you do with aspirin. You're going to see that that's probably not the case. So, more evidence that aspirin is neither safe nor effective for the prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation has come from a Danish registry study that was published in October 2011 in this uh, journal called Thrombosis and Hemostasis. And one of the authors down here, I, I just put his quote in, and then we'll see some information that sort of goes with this. There's a perception that aspirin is a safer alternative to oral anticoagulation for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation patients but now we know this simply is not the case, and we're going to see why. So this Danish registry study of 100, had 146,000 patients. So I was telling you those other trials of 18,000, 14,000 were large trials. They looked at 146,000 patients. Well, why is that so important, telling you that these studies are large numbers of patients? because the statistics of the studies improve when you have more people in, the more numbers of patients, the better the statistics. An example of that would be, if I take a coin and I flip a coin four times and heads comes up four times, kind of go, hmm, all right, let me keep flipping. I now flip 15 times and by chance, heads comes up 15 times in a row. Well. Maybe I just didn't flip that coin enough. If I flip the coin a thousand times, chances are it's going to be close to a 50-50 split, heads and tails. 
because I flipped it enough times. There's a chance, true chance, that if I flip it 15 times, I could get heads all 15 times, just by chance. But if I do it enough times, statistically, it's going to come out pretty close to 50-50 heads and tails. So the more patients in a trial, the better the statistics become. So it's more useful information. And what they found in this, this study um, of 146,000 patients is that the net clinical benefit for aspirin was not positive at any level of stroke risk. It was neither safe nor effective. Another important finding was that warfarin was associated with, with a net clinical benefit in all AFib patients except those at the very lowest risk, meaning a chads vast score of zero. It's only in these very low risk patients that the bleeding risk of warfarin outweighs the benefit. So what they actually found in this study, I don't know if I have it here on the next slide, I might. Um, what they actually found in this study was that there was a higher risk of bleeding complications in the aspirin group than the Coumadin group in those who maintained an INR between two to three. And overall, it was still lower even outside of that two to three range. So the aspirin was not effective, it didn't lower the risk of stroke, and there was a higher bleeding complication compared to warfarin. Now this study, by the way, because it came out in, in, in October, but it had gone on for a while before that, right? So they had to get all the information together but, and then publish it. So it was out before Pradaxa was out and all those other rivaroxaban, the other medicines that I mentioned. So the new Danish study that I just mentioned was in line with the latest European Society of Cardiology guidelines, which were updated just a year ago. These guidelines advised against using aspirin for stroke prevention in any AFib patients after a Japanese study showed no benefit in even low-risk patients. No benefit at all for aspirin in another study out of Japan. The European Society of Cardiology updated the guidelines based on this study. Now our, our study, meaning the Danish registry study, has provided more real-world data in support of this recommendation, meaning not to use aspirin. There's no benefit at all, as best we can tell, based on, on a number of uh, uh, studies now, and uh, an increased risk of bleeding. I know, a lot of you are not happy. <laughs> so just to refresh our memory for a second about this chads vast score, so again, we, we assign points to certain variables based on medical history, age, uh, gender, uh, previous uh, blood clots or strokes, vascular disease, and again, the one thing that's missing on this, and I apologize, is if you have coronary artery disease, narrowed or blocked arteries in the heart. Okay, so, whoops, I'm in trouble now. How do I go back? Uh, oh, I didn't want that. I thought it said Okay, let's unblack <laughs> and previous. Okay. So, what's our risk of stroke if we're not anticoagulated? Well, this point system is based on the CHADS VASC, or actually, it was, it was actually based on the CHADS scoring system, but it holds true nonetheless even for the CHADS VASC scoring system. So if somebody has a CHADS VASC or a CHADS score of zero, their annual risk of stroke, not anticoagulated, not on anything to prevent stroke, is 1.9% per year. So it's not zero. It's still one, even though it's low, it's still almost 2% per year. If your score is one, it's 2.8% per year. But you can see if you get all the way up to a six or above, I mean, you're cruising there. You're up to 18% risk of stroke. So it, it gets pretty significant. And, and again, now we're finding though in these studies, if your score is a one where your risk is 2.8% per year, the net benefit of, of Coumadin or other anticoagulants is significant in lowering your risk of stroke even at a one, even at a one. So it, it's an interesting concept because women are a one right off the bat. So uh, you, one can make an argument, all females with AFib need to be anticoagulated. It becomes confusing medically for us in terms of what to do with our young female patients with AFib. Do we recommend anticoagulation? Don't we? And 
you know, what I do basically is I go through just what we went through in an office visit. That's why I'm always behind, by the way, in the office. Um, so I go through this information, literally, about the Danish Registry Study, the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, the, the studies from Japan, et cetera, and we talk it through if it makes sense or not. I mean, you know, my thought about this is we take a young person, um, the downside to being anticoagulated is pretty minimal. The likelihood they're gonna have a problem with anticoagulation is minimal, but the, the devastating effects of stroke, that's pretty significant. So I tend to err on the side of, of warfarin or, or Pradax or whatever it may be. I think if it were me, I'd probably be anticoagulated if I had a score of one. In particular, if my one was from high blood pressure. In particular. That seems to be a higher risk one than other, other ones. Um, and again, we see as your points go up, your, your percent chance go of, of having a stroke goes up. Okay, well, we thankfully now have a scoring system to help us figure out who's at risk of bleeding from anticoagulation. So we can't just haphazardly put people on Coumadin or Pradaxa just because their scores are high, one, like a one, for example, or a two. So what we do is they, they came out with something called the Hasbled score. Um, which is a, a scoring system to figure out who might be at risk for bleeding. And again, it's sort of a, it's, it's, um, a mnemonic to help us remember. So if somebody has a, a history of hypertension, so meaning their blood pressure's been kind of difficult to control, we'll, we'll give them a one. If they have abnormal kidney function or liver function, uh, you get one point for each. If you have both, you get two points. If you've had a previous stroke, you get a point. If you've had bleeding problems like gastrointestinal bleeding, you get a point. Uh, label, labile INRs, meaning really difficult, and again, this kind of came out, excuse me, prior to Pradax and things like that, so it's mainly talking about people being on Coumadin, and people that you have difficulty keeping their INR between two to three, it's always four or six or eight, um, or it's 1.1, and then the next thing you know, it's 5.2, uh, um, so it's all over the place. People over I'm not quite sure why they say this is elderly, but uh, over the age of 65. Um, and then um, certain types of medicines, potentially, and alcohol uh, might increase your risk. A and what we do is we try and add the score up, and generally the breaking point is if your Hasbled score is three or greater, you might be at increased risk of bleeding, and it might not be appropriate to be on anticoagulation. But I put in qualifying terms, word there, might, might, um, or might not. Well, there's actually other models out there, and, and I have to admit, I, I wasn't familiar with this until I prepared for this lecture, but I'm happy I found it. Um, and, and it's called hemorrhages, um, is, the, is the model. Uh, and again, it's just a, a mnemonic, and it gives us a, a way of another point system here to figure out who might be at risk. Now, one of the things I really like about this is it includes fall risk. Certainly people who are at fall risk, we might not want to anticoagulate. Falling, hitting your head and bleeding in your head can be as devastating, if not more devastating, than a blood clot going to your brain. So, so fall risk, I think, is a really important thing, and the Hasbled score doesn't have that. Um, they have other things about decreased platelet count. Platelets are a type of blood cell that helps us form blood clots, different than that whole clotting cascade that I showed you. But I think the important thing here is that we do have a scoring system that helps us figure out who needs to be anticoagulated and who might be at risk. These are not absolutes, though. They're guidelines, right? They're help, helping us, physicians and our patients, to figure out what, what's best for you. And, and again, this is just sort of um, like my bleeding picture. I didn't want to get anything too graphic, so I thought I'd just put that in. Um, and again, this is just uh, uh, kind of giving you an idea of if your score is, is zero, your risk of bleeding uh, per 100 patient years is 1.9%, and it goes all the way up to about 12% 12, 12 when your score on the hemorrhages score is five or, or above. So interesting, I had a patient today I saw in the hospital on a consult for a consultative visit who her risk of stroke is about 12.5%, not anticoagulated, and, and her risk of bleeding, anticoagulated, is 12.3%. What do you do? I don't know. Hopefully you guys can help me with that. 
So this was kind of an interesting slide. This was about INRs, international normalized ratio. This was the, the blood test that we get for Coumadin to see if you're where we want you to be. And what we know, what this tells us is, if you're between two and three, your risk of stroke and intracranial bleed is really low. But if you're outside those parameters, your risk of stroke goes up and your risk of bleeding goes up. So really, we have a, what's called a, a narrow therapeutic range, but if we can accomplish that therapeutic range, it's a relatively safe drug. Just quickly, because um, I don't, do, are we on a time thing? Okay, I'll, I'll try not to keep you much longer though. I'll try and go through this a little bit more quickly so that I can answer questions for you. So there's, we, we classify atrial fibrillation in, in several ways, something called paroxysmal or intermittent atrial fibrillation, which is where the episode terminates itself within a seven day period, but generally it occurs in less than 24 hours. Persistent atrial fibrillation is where it lasts more than seven days and often requires either medicines or cardioversion to take care of it. Permanent AFib is something we often refer to as chronic atrial fibrillation. So permanent atrial fibrillation, it persists uh, for more than one year, either because cardioversion has failed or not attempted. Uh, and then again, we talked about lone AFib, where they have no risk factors, there's really nothing else going on, typically in young patients with no heart problems at all. And this is just sort of an algorithm for us to use, and I don't follow this strictly, and it was just sort of a representative of what we might do with somebody who's newly diagnosed. So hemodynamically stable means their blood pressure's okay, they're feeling okay. We can either anticoagulate them for a while um, and, and then um, uh, possibly uh, for three weeks and then possibly bring them in and try and convert them to a normal heart rhythm or just control their heart rate. Um, if they're not anticoagulated or their INRs are less than two, uh, we can do something called a transesophageal echo and cardiovert them. So you guys are gonna have questions on that. Um, we can just do rate control. There's many different things we can do. Well, this is just another way of, of looking at some of the things that we can do for people. Um, if, we, if we're trying to maintain sort of maintenance or long-term therapy, somebody without symptoms, all we might want to do, if you're not having symptoms with your atrial fibrillation, we might just want to control your heart rate. Just not let it go too fast, but leave you in atrial fibrillation. And if you need to be anticoagulated, anticoagulate you. And then we can control your heart rate with things like beta blockers, like metoprolol, atenolol, um, propranolol, calcium channel blockers like diltiazem or verapamil, or digoxin, which really is not very effective and really should be reserved. This isn't 100% true, but for either a second or third line drug, meaning we're not accomplishing it with beta blockers and or calcium channel blockers, we should, could then add digoxin probably shouldn't be using digoxin by itself. It's not very effective in controlling heart rate by itself. Um, if you're not having symptoms, we could also consider rhythm control, meaning trying to get you back to a normal heart rhythm and keeping you there with medicines like amiodarone, ticosin, sodalol, uh, flecainide, rhythmol, or we can even consider something called ablation, which I know people have questions about. Um, if one is having symptoms, we might really want to think about rhythm control. Rhythm meaning getting you back to a normal heart rhythm. And we can accomplish that through antiarrhythmic medicines, these over here, and probably cardioversion, which is where we put a pad on your chest, usually a pad on your back, knock you out, deliver a small electric shock from front pad to back pad, and voila, hopefully back in a normal heart rhythm. Well, sometimes, sometimes in order to accomplish that, we have to do something called a transesophageal echo, which is an ultrasound that's at the end of a long scope, goes down your throat, allows us to take pictures ultrasound pictures of your heart, make sure we don't see any blood clots in there. There's reasons why we might do that before we do an, an electrical cardioversion. And we can get into that in, in the questions if people want to. And then there's also out there something called AFib ablation and AV node ablation, which we'll talk about in, in just a second. So this was kind of interesting. I, I just thought this was, I, I just wanted to put this in there because I found it as I was going through information on this. Nearly 100 years ago, uh, year, uh, nearly 100 years have passed since a Dutch merchant first astonished Dr. Carl Winkiebach with the ability to terminate episodes of atrial fibrillation through self-medication with quinine. 
So we used to use quinidine, which is a form of quinine, um, as an antiarrhythmic. We no longer use it because it actually kills people. So, but, um, but, but we used to use it. Um, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, even 100 years ago, uh, they, this was an issue. It was an issue, and, and, and people figured out ways of, uh, of, of fixing it. So, so what do we want to do? Do we want to do rate control, meaning just control one's heart rate, or do we want to do rhythm control, try and get people back to a normal heart rhythm? And the, main, the, the big trial that most people talk about, and I do, and my patients have probably heard me talk about this, um, is called the AFFIRM trial. And I, don't, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but nonetheless, the AFFIRM trial, which showed that there was no appreciable difference in outcome with either approach. So if you left people in atrial fibrillation, controlled their heart rate, and if they needed to be on Coumadin, you put them on Coumadin, they did just as well as the people that you put, tried to get back to a normal heart rhythm. There's no appreciable difference. The people who didn't do well were those that were symptomatic in their atrial fibrillation, right? But, but otherwise, if they weren't having symptoms, there was no real difference. Um, rate control, as I mentioned, consists of medicines to slow conduction through that AV node. Remember talking about that in the beginning? That little area between the top chambers of the heart and the bottom chambers of the heart where you pay your toll, the gate goes up. So these medicines that we use, the beta blockers like metoprolol, the calcium channel blockers like diltiazem and verapamil, and even digoxin, they keep that gate down longer. So you pay your toll and you're like, oh, what's wrong with this thing? And then finally the gate goes up. So it slows the heart rate down, the conduction down to the bottom chambers. So again, we mentioned beta blockers being an example, metoprolol, atenolol, propranolol, all the lols. Uh, calcium channel blockers like verapamil, diltiazem, and digoxin. Again, this is, seems to be our least effective and probably has most side effects. Um, if we find that AV nodal blocking agents don't control the heart rate, we can actually ablate the AV node. So down here, it's not a great picture, but we can burn that out so the electrical activity can't go from top chamber to bottom chamber, but then you have to get one of these things, a pacemaker. Okay, because then you have no electrical impulse going from top to bottom, and we need to coordinate that a little bit. So you need a pacemaker if we do that. We are not doing this as frequently as we used to um, because we have something called AFib ablation, which we'll mention in just a second. Now again, just getting back to rhythm control, trying to get people back to a normal heart rhythm and then keeping them there, um, we, we use medicines called antiarrhythmic medicines. Antiarrhythmic, so meaning they're trying to stop the rhythm, the arrhythmia. They're trying to stop the arrhythmia, the atrial fibrillation, so they're anti-arrhythmic. Um, amiodarone is probably our most effective drug, but it probably has the most side effects when used long term. So we tend not to use it in people um, under the age of 75. Um, because it really seems like the, the side effects, problems with the liver, the lungs, the thyroid, um, come about with really long-term use. So putting a 40-year-old on amiodarone, and if they live, hopefully, to get into their 80s, 90s, I mean, we're talking, you know, 40, 50 years of being on amiodarone, they're probably, gonna, probably going to have side effects from that medicine. Some newer drugs that we have out there, Ticacin, um, some of you may have heard about, Sotolol, uh, also called Betapace. Um, these medicines often require a hospital stay for us to initiate these medicines, usually three days. You have to get six doses in, so, and they're twice day dosing, so it's usually three days, and we have to watch on a heart monitor. Um, and the reason for that is this statement down here. All antiarrhythmic medicines can be pro-arrhythmic. What does that mean? Well, they can actually cause heart rhythms that might be worse than the one we're trying to treat. But it tends to occur, if it's going to occur, during the first several days, the first six doses. And that's why we need to watch in the hospital on a monitor so that if, God forbid, something happens, we're there to respond to it. Um, with that said, even though they can all be proarrhythmic, these are medicines that we use very, very commonly, very commonly. There's a medicine out there called Multag, um, which is a variant of amiodarone, and we thought like all drugs when they come out, we thought it was going to be a miracle drug. So not quite as effective as amiodarone, but pretty effective. But it had like none, uh, reportedly none of the side effects of amiodarone. Well, what we found is that we can't use it in persistent or uh, chronic atrial fibrillation. There actually was increased mortality. People were dying when that was happening. Um, and there's been reports of liver failure with Multag, some of which have required uh, liver transplants. 
So I, uh, we have stopped in our group prescribing Moltac. Um, we have very few patients left on it. Those who are left on it want to remain on it despite us telling them about the issues with Moltac. Um, there's another thing called pill in the pocket, some of you may have heard about, and that's where we can use a medicine antiarrhythmic called Rhythmol or Flecainide, and, and that's a special group of people who kind of pretty much know when they're in AFib. They don't have any structural heart disease. They don't have any other significant medical problems. We've tried these medicines in a monitored setting in the emergency department, and basically what they do is if they feel they go into AFib, it's not breaking, they can take, for example, 600 milligrams of Rhythmol on their own at home, swallow it, and it usually will break their AFib for them. So it's called pill in the pocket. So they carry the pills in their pocket, and when they have their AFib, they take it. It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. It's actually the minority of people that we see that can do this. So what are the principles of antiarrhythmic therapy to maintain a normal sinus rhythm, which means a normal heart rhythm? Well, we're trying to reduce the symptoms from atrial fibrillation. We're, the, our ability to actually um, maintain a normal heart rhythm is only modest with these medicines. You know, most people think, oh, I'm going to get on these medicines, I'm never going to have my AFib again. It's not true. Our hope with these medicines is that we'll decrease the number of episodes per year and decrease your symptoms. That's our, that's, that's our hope. Um, so again, here, the, the drug may reduce rather than eliminate. Um, an important thing to keep in mind is if one drug fails, it doesn't mean you're not going to respond to another drug. So if we bring in and we start you on Ticacin and it doesn't work, we can try Sotolol or we can try Rhythmol or we can try Amiodarone. We're not trying Moltag though. Um, <clears throat> Drug-induced proarrhythmia or extra cardiac side effects are frequent. I actually don't find that to be the case. This again is from the European Society of Cardiology. I, I don't find that proarrhythmia, meaning causing other heart rhythms that are worse than the one we're trying to treat, I don't find that to be frequent at all. In fact, I, I've never seen it, ever, in, in all my years of using these medicines. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I've just never seen it. Um, that's, that's pretty much it with that. Okay, so just to go on a little bit, um, and we kind of talked about this already in terms of rhythm control. We can consider cardioverting people. That's probably our, our, our best, one of the best ways of, car of getting people back to a normal heart rhythm is electrically shocking the heart back to a normal heart rhythm. And again, sometimes we have to do a transesophageal echo where we put a scope down, which has an ultrasound probe at the end of it. We're down in your esophagus and we're getting great pictures of your heart, making sure we don't see a blood clot in that top left chamber of your heart before we go ahead and deliver a small electric shock. Um, we don't need to do that for everybody. We need to do that for people who um, we don't know how long they've been in atrial fibrillation and we want to get them out of it quickly. We do that for people who have been anticoagulated with Coumadin, for example, but their INR has drifted below two for a period of time and we don't know how long, so they could have developed a blood clot. Um, so w sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, and sometimes we'll do cardioversions with or without antiarrhythmic medicines. I tend to be one of the type of cardiologists who prefer to do it with antiarrhythmic medicines. I think it gives us a higher chance of success, uh, both initially getting people back to a normal heart rhythm and maintaining a normal heart rhythm. Uh, one of my partners, I won't mention who, one of my partners uh, often likes to do it, the initial cardioversion without antiarrhythmic therapy. There's, there's no right or wrong. There's just different ways of approaching it. Um, Another option, though, about getting people back to a normal heart rhythm is something called ablation, which people are hearing more and more about these days. Um, the older way of doing it is something called radiofrequency ablation, um, where it actually heats the tissue in the heart to try and get rid of atrial fibrillation. I'm going to show you what, where that is in just a second. The newer form is something called cryoablation, where it actually freezes the tissue in the, in the heart to try and stop the atrial fibrillation. Um, so what happens is the uh, electrophysiologists, who are cardiologists who do this procedure, so they further specialize in cardiology, they put a catheter into the vein down in the groin area and snake it up from the, the vein down in the groin area up into the heart, and they actually puncture through this wall, and they get over here to where these pulmonary veins are. I don't know if you remember me showing you that in the beginning. 
and they start burning or freezing the tissue around those pulmonary veins. And what they do though, they don't just do it haphazardly, they actually map out the electrical properties of the heart with very high-tech equipment. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and they figure out where the area most likely is that's causing the atrial fibrillation and then they either burn it or freeze it. So, actually let me see what my next slide is. Maybe. Okay. So, um, it's interesting though, when they talk about success rate of atrial fibrillation, of AFib ablation, the electrophysiologists in the literature will tell you that there's about an 85% success rate with the first ablation. Well, that's, uh-oh, what do you mean first ablation? <laughs> a lot of people do need to go on to a second ablation because they don't often take care of the problem with the first ablation. But their definition of success is very different than all of our definition of success. The definition of success for the ablation is decreased episodes of atrial fibrillation, not elimination of atrial fibrillation. So they have about an 85% success rate with the first ablation, and then, the, and then they're up in the high 90s, like 98% on, if you need to go on for a second ablation. Now, with that said, I do have a number of patients who have had ablations and have not had any recurrence of their AFib. With that said, I will tell you that in 2012, there's absolutely nothing we can do that will, I can say with any fair certainty that we can totally get rid of one's AFib. There's something called the maze procedure. I don't know if people have heard about the maze procedure. So it's generally done during times of surgery. So somebody's going for open heart bypass surgery, they're going for heart valve surgery, but they also have AFib. And what the surgeon then does is they kind of cut out a maze in those top chambers of the heart, the atria. And that was supposed to be a permanent fix for AFib. It's not. Most of my patients who have had the maze procedure are back in AFib. I had one gentleman who's back in AFib and I can't get him out of it at all, where I used to be able to actually get him out of it. I can't get him out of it at all anymore, so we just control his heart rate. But even that's become difficult. So there's really no permanent fix in 2012 that, that you can go for and just say, oh, I'm done. But I do have to say, I think the AFib ablations are probably the closest thing we have right now. It's sort of the hottest area of, of uh, research in AFib, other than anticoagulation, but it's the hottest area uh, of, of um, research. Um, another thing that I just want to say is, once one gets atrial fibrillation, you will get it again. Doesn't matter why you got it, when you got it, you most likely will get it again. And why do I say that? Because there's some people who have come out of surgery who have had AFib and their doctor will say to them, oh, it was just from the surgery. Well, they're probably right. It probably was just from the surgery. But that person most likely will get AFib again. They may not get it for a week. They may not get it for a month. They may not get it for a year. They may not get it for 10 years. But they will get it again most likely. Nothing's 100%. Unfortunately, I often see people with their second episode of AFib presenting as a stroke. And I bring that up because that whole scoring system, that Chad's vast scoring system, if I see somebody with AFib and I think it's, oh, it's just from that surgery, or it's just from that urinary tract infection that you had, or it's just from the pneumonia, if their score is high enough that they warrant anticoagulation, I recommend anticoagulation, even if they go years without it. One of my partners just had a patient, <laughs> it's interesting, just had a patient who had AFib years ago and just kept bothering my partner about coming off Coumadin because every monitoring that they've done over the last probably five years, no AFib, no AFib. They took the patient off Coumadin, they just had AFib. Just, now thankfully not a stroke, but went back into AFib. Once you get it, doesn't matter why you get it, you most likely will get it again. Okay, last thing. Some good websites. So for those of you who like to get on the internet, this, the top one called stopafib.org, really good. It's by patients for patients. So it's, it, the, the website is by patients with AFib, for patients with AFib. So it's not by doctors or anything like that, although they have lots of useful information. In fact, so useful, I use it. I think it's excellent. I love that website. This is one that I found um, as I was preparing for this talk. Uh, I didn't know it existed, but I like it a lot. Uh, uh, AFstat.com, AFibstat.com. Another good one that your handouts that I uh, uh, was able to make for you today um, is from CardioSmart 
I'll leave this up so you guys don't have to rush to read this, to write this down. Cardiosmart.org. So this is a great website, not just for AFib, but for all cardiovascular disease. It's from the American College of Cardiology. It's from the American College of Cardiology. It's, it's a patient education website. So there's no medical terms, no medical jargon. It's, it's like a WebMD just for hearts. Um, and then you can also go to most major universities and clinics, for example, like the Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic or Johns Hopkins or Mass General, um, Tufts, uh, UMass. They, they all have them. The, the one thing I'll, I'll tell you not to do, really tell you not to do, well, two things. Don't just Google AFib, because God knows what you'll get. And, and every, it's amazing. When you start talking to people about AFib, everybody has a thought, an opinion, uh, a horror story, whatever. T talk with your doctors. Don't, don't, people mean well, but they don't realize that they're frightening you. you know, they're making you nervous and frightened by a lot of their comments that they make. They don't mean it. They mean their intentions are good but the results are bad. So you're much better off talking to your physician about it, looking at some of these websites, and getting some really useful, uh, appropriate information. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. This is actually, gentlemen. Uh, sorry, we'll get you. In. Uh, Dr. Brownstein, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my wife has been in an AFib for the last three, four years, and uh, she's on Coumadin. Also, she also has a pacemaker that you put in years ago. <laughs> now, we like to go to stock car races. We haven't been going, but all that vibration from the engines will that do any harm. In regard to the AFib or the pacemaker or both? Both of them. So, uh, I don't... I don't know the absolute answer to that, but my, my feeling my, and thoughts would be probably not. not. I, don't, I can't think of a reason how that would cause issues with atrial fibrillation or the pacemaker. Right. And one more question sure. about the uh, INR. Yeah. She tested at home yeah. once a week. We yeah. got our own machine at yeah. home to test her. And it stays between two and three. Lately, it's been going closer to, to, the, T, uh, to the two. Yeah. Now, is that okay, or should we stay around two and a half? No, as long 25. as it's between two and three, that's perfectly acceptable. Even wow. 2.0. If you're 2.0 consistently, that's perfectly acceptable. Yep. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's a gentleman all the way in the back. A few months ago, we got a report written in the newspaper on an extensive study done on the satin drug, which indicated that the effects of it were far more than what they initially reported. Would you comment on that? It depends on what you're talking about. I mean, there's various things about the statin drugs. Are you talking about the memory issues and the diabetes? Right, right. Yeah. Those things that they ran into that were more severe than what they thought. Yeah. So I'll answer that, and then what I'd like to do after that is just hopefully keep it to atrial fibrillation if we can, but I'll be happy to answer that. So, so the incidence of, of those, of diabetes is about, uh, it's less than 1%, and, and, and same with the memory issues. They're not that significant. The, the authors, actually, of those studies have actually recommended that people not stop their statins based on this information. They, the, the authors of the study actually say the benefits far outweigh the risks in the appropriate patient population. Uh, I have, yeah, I have to plead ignorance. I, I don't know. I, I have not heard that. Uh, that may be the case. I just haven't heard that or read that. Uh, that, that may be the case, though. Um, you have a question? Oh. I don't need that. Doctor, um, um, you said earlier that the, you talked about amiodaro. Yes. I was on that for a while, for a lot of years. Suddenly, one day in the summertime, my legs gave out on me. And I realized at that time that uh, something was wrong, but I also was told not to go out in the sun after taking that medicine. Yes, yeah, so some, some people can have photosensitivity with amiodarone. Now then after that, my, my cardiologist said take the baby aspirin. Is that a, a, li a reliable substitute for amiodarone? Uh, no. It, I don't know why they, the, the two are totally disparate. They're not, they're not for the same thing at all. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what, it, it, you know, it's hard to know what that was about. There, yeah. One more thing, I won't keep you, but the, the next question was about um, the doctor and uh, Coumadin, one versus the other. Yeah. 
Can you tell me what percentage of your patients are on the Coumadin as opposed to the other? Yeah, um, probably, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, but I would probably say 85, 90% are on Coumadin, if not more. Is that because of your choice or your choosing? Often, yes. You know, obviously in cardiology, we tend to have an older patient population, um, although I do have young, younger patients as well. Um, but, but again, I, I won't, and mo my partners, for the most part, won't prescribe Pradaxa for people 75 years of age and older. Um, what one is, I'm sorry. So 75 years of age and older, we will not prescribe Pradaxa well, in, in our practice because of the increased risk of gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, for a while there, the FDA was actually investigating whether or not there might have been bleeding, higher incidence of bleeding in people under the age of 75. So we actually, until we got the information that that wasn't the case, we actually held off prescribing Pradaxa as well. And so that's why I think our percentage in our group is probably skewed uh, toward a much higher percentage of warfarin than Pradaxa. Um, so I think that, again, a older population for our patients. Stay away and, from the yeah, if you're 75 and above, I would not recommend Pradaxa. Okay, because I've been on the Coumadin for about a year. But contrary to what some doctors think, there are times when I freeze to death because of Coumadin. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, there are other people who said the same thing. So it, it does happen to me, doctor. Okay. Go ahead. On the Pradaxa, I don't understand how they can advertise Pradaxa or any drug that you have to get through your doctor. If it should be something because every person's got to be different, and it should be between them and the doctor. Yeah. Yet they advertise like crazy. Not right. only Pradaxa, but other but all medicines. Yeah. All medicines. Well, th th that's why I said earlier w about the advertising. I, it drives me crazy. It drives most physicians crazy because it, it's um, I don't want to say it's inappropriate, but I'm not sure it's appropriate. Uh, I, I think it, it creates a lot of issues and, and, and uh, difficulties. I mean, I think the good thing about it is it does allow patients to hear about some of these medicines and bring it up to their doctors, but um, I think pr probably a more appropriate way is for the physician to bring up the me new medicines to the patient. Um, but obviously, the reason for that is they want patients to bring it up to their doctors, doctors to prescribe it, and they make money. So that's where that comes from. Go ahead. Probably not. So for the most part, Coumadin doesn't cause bleeding. It makes bleeding worse. Where it can cause spontaneous bleeding, though, is when the INR starts approaching double digits, like 10 or above. Um, some people lower than that, but that's generally where we see it. So aspirin, on the other hand, can. So aspirin actually can cause bleeding problems. And that's part of where I showed you some of those studies looking at um, aspirin being of no benefit in lowering risk of stroke and actually being somewhat harmful, increased risk of bleeding compared to Coumadin. Um, so for the most part, the answer to that, can Coumadin cause bleed, you said bleeding ulcers, right? Was your question? For, for the most part, the answer to that is no. So but it will make them worse. It's not good to take the aspirin with the Coumadin? I have lots of patients on aspirin and Coumadin because they need their aspirin for coronary artery disease and they have atrial fibrillation, so that combination we do need to do. It may, we may have evidence now, though, that that does increase their, well, we've always known that anytime you start combining uh, medicines that, that decrease the likelihood of clot formation can increase your risk of bleeding. But again, it's a risk-benefit ratio. We're trying to give you the most benefit with the least amount of risk, but not no risk. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, that's not uncommon. Uh, certainly the fatigue and decreased blood pressure can happen because, again, you're not getting that coordinated contraction of blood from the top chambers of the heart to the bottom chambers, and then you're having erratically beating bottom chambers, and they're be often beating fast, so the amount of blood getting out to your body isn't quite as much as it should be in some people, not all. Some people it has no effect at all, but in your particular case, that might be what's happening. So you're just not getting enough blood out to your brain, your body, to maintain blood pressure and make you feel good, so your brain might not be getting enough uh, blood flow. How low is too low? 
Yeah, it's a good question and it's difficult. I mean, I have patients who have uh, certain cardiac conditions and need to be on certain medicines where they walk around all the time with uh, blood pressure of 75 over, you know, 50 and, and they're doing okay. Um, I have other patients though who are symptomatic with blood pressures of 110 over 70. Um, so it's pretty variable. Um, I think, you know, I, in general, I don't worry about numbers. I worry about symptoms, but I think once you start getting below 75 for the top number of systolic blood pressure, it's a little concerning. No other, I have just the one, number one. So yeah, that. female gender. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you're that really difficult situation with uh, what to do. I mean, technically, you should be anticoagulated based on the most recent information. Um, it's fun. We had this, I had this conversation with some of my colleagues this afternoon, actually. You know, what, what, what would you do? And everybody sort of goes back and forth because there's something about it that's uncomfortable about saying to you, you should be anticoagulated to be totally honest with you. On the other hand, you know, there's something uncomfortable about saying don't be anticoagulated. And you know, in your particular situation where you're a one because of female gender, I, I, I say to people often, we're gonna know in retrospect, whatever decision one chooses, aspirin or Coumadin or whatever, uh, or, or Pradaxa, we'll know in retrospect if we made the right decision. Meaning, when we look two, three, five, ten years from now back, we'll know if we made the right decision. Unfortunately, looking prospectively from this point forward is difficult. And, and, and that's, that's what makes medicine sometimes so difficult and can be frustrating to patients, family members, et cetera, is that things are easy when you know the outcome. So three years from now, if you said to somebody with a CHADS VAS score of one, oh, don't go on Coumadin or don't go on Pradax and they have a stroke, well, now they had a stroke, you look back and you say, well, geez, that was the wrong decision. But from this point, looking to the future, that's not such an easy decision. Because on the other hand, if we put you on Pradaxa and you had a major bleed, bleeding complication for some reason, you shouldn't, but if you did, then we look back and we say, geez, we made the wrong decision, we shouldn't have put you on anything. And, and so that's where medicine becomes so difficult. And to be honest with you, that's where malpractice lawsuits come in, right? Because everything's easy looking backwards. When you have all the information and the outcome, it's real easy then. And, and so that's when people get angry, well, why did you do that, why didn't you do that? Well, it wasn't so easy at that point looking forward. It's real easy now you see everything there. Do you know if there's any clinical trials or anything going on right now? Well, I think they're always ongoing, but again, I think based on the information that's out there, you probably shouldn't be on aspirin because the benefit really is not there. The harm is there. The net benefit of anticoagulation is there. So technically, you should be anticoagulated. As difficult as that is to say. Yes? Yes. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has had it, but I just went through one in April, and uh, it's no fun. No. Uh, they, they, and unfortunately, it didn't work out. Right. So was that your first? So for those of you who may not have heard that, the, the gentleman in the back had said he went for catheter ablation in April. It was no fun, and it didn't work out. And and um, it it's not the most pleasant procedure in the world. It's a long procedure. Um, I, I don't know all the details because I don't do the procedure. Electrophysiologists do it. Um, but uh, my understanding is that you need to be awake for a good portion of it. Um, be well, actually, he, uh, I was uh, unconscious for something like five hours. Yep. I only remember going in. Yeah. A lot of that's the medicine they use, but they probably sort of brought you in and out of different states of, of awareness. And, but your memory of it is that you were asleep. And, uh, but it's a long procedure, and, and again, it's about an 85% success rate, so about 15% of the time it doesn't work with that first ablation. Huh. I know him well. I do. You, did, you had three. Yeah, three ablations, yeah. Yep. Right. Right. You're not the first person I've heard say that, where they, they would not want to go through it again because it was uh, an uncomfortable procedure in, in the big picture. Um, it, I, think, I think it depends on the degree of symptoms that one's having and our ability to control the, the symptoms without ablation. 
Um, the electrophysiologists often will um, say to patients that they want them to try antiarrhythmic medicines before they do the ablation, although there's literature now to suggest that ablation can be a first-line therapy. Just skip all those things I talked about and move right on to ablation. But I think here in the Northeast that, that we're still more conservative and we're not quite doing that yet. Other parts of the country, they are. What I have done is uh, I was first diagnosed with AFib back in 1988. And uh, the general consensus of uh, every time I talk to a doctor, it says, well, it won't, uh, it won't kill you, but the stroke will follow Right. You know? well, no, go ahead. Uh, and uh, so I've been on amarodion, and I was in the hospital here one time for a very low heart rate uh, uh, caused by AFib. And uh, I, I think I was here nine days, and it was to try these different medicines. And one of the medicines that was tried was Tethysin, but it was rejected. Now, as a result of this uh, ablation, I'm on Tethys, uh, uh, and uh, you know, my family and I have said, why, why bother with it if, if it didn't work before? Well, Dr. Rosenthal is going through a whole series of things just to see uh, uh, what, they, what he can do uh, about it. Right, so sometimes what may occur, um, just to briefly summarize, so, so He's, he had the ablation, it didn't work, now he's on the, one of the antiarrhythmics called Ticacin, although he had tried Ticacin in the past, which didn't seem to either work or agree with him. Um, but sometimes after even a failed ablation, you may be more, your heart may be more um, prone to, to respond to some of the antiarrhythmics that didn't work prior. And, and so that's why some, the electrophysiologist will sometimes put people on, for example, Ticacin, even though it might not have worked in, in the past. Go ahead. Uh, is there any connection between stress and AFib? So I get this question a lot for stress and almost everything. Um, and the absolute answer is I don't know, but it's hard to imagine it doesn't have some effect. Right? I mean, you know, but the, the problem is that almost everybody in, in 2012 is under a fair amount of stress, no matter what they do with their lives. Uh, there's very, very few people who aren't uh, under a tremendous amount of stress the economy, the politics, whatever it may be, most of us are under a fair amount of stress. I, I'm not familiar with any literature that says there's an absolute connection between the two, uh, but again, it's hard to imagine that, that there's not some connection. It, it sort of makes me think, though, about one of the things I often tell my patients, which kind of relates to what you're, you're talking about, in that when they have episodes of atrial fibrillation, so if it's coming and going, it's intermittent, I tell them one of the best things you can do if you're able to, which sounds crazy, is meditate. And, and the reason is that the normal response to feeling your heart, you know, fish on deck, flopping around inside there, um, is to get what's called a fight or flight syndrome. Your body knows there's something not right. And so your adrenaline level goes up. And all that does is drive your heart rate up, drives your symptoms up, which becomes this positive feedback mechanism. Well, if you can kind of chill yourself out a little bit by meditating or just relaxing and saying, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to have a heart attack, I'm going to be okay, sometimes that brings down your adrenaline level, slows the heart rate down, and people become less symptomatic and sometimes will actually spontaneously convert back to a normal heart rhythm. Um, I've had this twice. And uh, the first time I had it, I was stressed that I brought on myself. All right. Um, but yet, you know, I would say, from my personal experience, I would say it was stress that brought it on. Yeah, and, and again, I'm not familiar with literature that says that, but it's hard to imagine it doesn't have some effect like that. Um, stress just can do so many things to us that it's hard to imagine that it's, it's, there's not some effect. And, and the other thing is, I don't know, I don't feel my heart pulsing. I don't feel when it When you go into all. atrial fibrillation? Yeah, I don't feel it at all. Yep. I waited too long, I had the opposite breath, and I said, right. I this check Right, out. And, the, and the symptoms can be variable for people. It can be just fatigue, lethargy, shortness of breath. Some people come in saying they're having chest discomfort, but really what they're doing is they're experiencing their AFib. Um, and, but the most common symptom is palpitations. That's the most common symptom. Go ahead. What about tranquilizers? Do they help when um, <laughs> <laughs> It depends what we're talking about, but um, 
I, I don't know how to answer that, to be totally honest. The, the, I guess the absolute answer, the official answer is no. No, they, 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 you know, it's not, it's not an approved medication for helping treat AFib. Certainly, you know, it may help you relax so that you don't cause that positive feedback mechanism of driving your heart rate up, but, but it's not anything that, that we should be prescribing for atrial fib, specific for atrial fibrillation. It, it potentially could, to be honest with you, it, it's more common when one is, is uh, fluid overloaded, like for example in congestive heart failure, um, where we actually cause us, by having too much fluid in our system, and I don't mean be, by drinking too much fluid, but actually congestive heart failure, it'll actually cause a stretch on the left atrium, that top left chamber of the heart, which can precipitate atrial fibrillation. I guess dehydration, if I sort of thought about it, potentially could do that, but it's not very, it would not be a very common cause. I have an episode of AFib, and I'm in discomfort for it could be 20 minutes. When my ICD is read, they say, oh, yes, you had one for 30 seconds. Because I'll bring in the date and time. Yeah. Why does that only show 30 seconds when I know it was 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah, I, it, that's difficult because we see that even like on Holter monitors, the heart monitors that people wear for 24 hours where they'll say, you know, I, I felt X, Y, or Z and there's either nothing there or there's just a little extra beat there, but they felt it for a lot longer. I don't know the answer to that and I'm not sure anybody knows it. I, I think the actual episode of electrical, of atrial fibrillation was whatever it was, but for whatever reason you're experiencing the sensation longer. And why that is, I don't know, but we definitely see that with other arrhythmias as well. And, and there's no clear explanation for that. Uh, and it, it's interesting, too. We see it often. It, it's a pretty common issue. Yes? Uh, when I'm in AFib and I come out of it back to sinus rhythm, I always get a very intense dizzy spell for about 10 seconds. Is that yep. common? Yeah, probably what's happening is your, your heart actually pauses. Uh, so one of the things that can occur is you're going from atrial fibrillation, going, 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 and then it actually stops and it stops beating for, it could be anywhere from two seconds, five seconds, I've seen it 15 seconds long. And so there's no contraction of your heart, no electrical activity, and then it, you boom, pop right back into a normal heart rhythm. So that's probably what's occurring. You're probably getting a pause in the electrical activity and your heartbeat, and then you kick back into a normal heart rhythm. Okay, one more, one more question. No? Go ahead. Right here. Um, so the winner you, is. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first I wanted to say that I don't have any, I've seen, apparently I have it all the time, most of the time, but I don't really have any symptoms, yep. but every now and then if I have a, an upsetting thing happen, I'll feel it, and my doctor gave me Valium, just two milligrams to take just then, not, and it, and it helps. Right. So, I, I don't know if people heard that, but um, she's essentially chronically in atrial fibrillation, for the most part doesn't feel her symptoms, but when she has an upsetting event, she then feels the symptoms of her atrial fibrillation. So that becomes a little bit difficult because it may be that you're really not feeling your atrial fibrillation. You may just be emotionally upset and you may have those types of symptoms even without your atrial fibrillation. Um, and, and unless, you, you know, you're in it chronically, so there's no way of really correlating that. If you were in it intermittently, then we could do a heart monitor and correlate your symptoms and your heart rhythm and see if in fact you're really in it when your symptoms are occurring. Um, again, tranquilizers, sedatives, we really don't want to prescribe for atrial fibrillation. Now, certainly if people have stress and anxiety and they need these medicines, um, uh, they can be used appropriately. We don't want to use them inappropriately. They are addictive medicines. Yeah, so, so, you know, okay, and if we were using it for AFib, I think we'd have a whole bunch of zombies walking around, so, so we don't want to use it for that. My second question was about the um, heart valve, um, the defective heart valve, okay. and if you have, when you have that repaired, would the AFib be likely to go away? So the question was, if you have a defective heart valve, as a I'm assuming you mean as a possible cause of your atrial fibrillation, and then you repair the heart valve, will the atrial fibrillation go away? And the answer is most likely not. No. Yeah, most likely not, because whatever, 
whatever caused your AFib is sort of there. And, and so now, once you get AFib for whatever reason, you're probably going to always have atrial fibrillation, or at least a recurrence at some point in your life. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody.